welcome to the First United Methodist Church online worship service. Today's service is performed by Pastor Aaron Ackney. Now here is today's service.
to turn from the tumult of the world that is passing away and focus our thoughts and attentions on the things eternal that are lasting. God calls us out of our individually self-centered lives into a fellowship of believers.
our traditional prayer. Father, as we come to this moment in our worship now, I ask that either through me or in spite of me, you would speak to us and our lives would be changed. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Some of you might remember that a couple weeks ago, we spoke about a remarkable man behind the spotlight in the book of Acts. His name was Barnabas. And I got a little worried that I would not get canceled for being sexist. So I thought maybe we should include a fabulous female, although she's not from the book of Acts. Clearly, she's in the Bible. Now, if I were to ask you to make a list of the most notable women in the whole Bible, you might make some suggestions like Eve, or Sarah, or Deborah, or Anna, or Esther, or Ruth, or Mary, or Lydia, or a couple other women. There's some great women in the Bible. But today, we're going to focus on perhaps the youngest impressive female in the Bible. That seemed appropriate to me since we just came out of vacation Bible school. And get this. You don't even know the name of the woman I'm talking about. Now, I can say that with confidence because we literally do not know her name. It's not recorded in the Bible. She's virtually hidden in a story about somebody else. We only know of her as a little girl or a young girl. We have no record of her growing up. And yet, she exhibits one of the most remarkable faith lives recorded in God's Word. I'm talking about the little slave girl to Naaman's wife. Here's a little bit of the story from 2 Kings. Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was honored by his master, and he had much respect because the Lord used him to give victory to Aram. He was a mighty and brave man, but he had a skin disease. Now, the Arameans had gone out to raid the Israelites and had taken a little girl as a captive. This little girl served Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, Oh, I wish that my master would meet the prophet who lives in Samaria. He would cure him of his skin disease. So Naaman went to the king and told him what the little girl from Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, Well, then go. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left and took with him about 750 pounds of silver as well as 150 pounds of gold along with 10 changes of clothes. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you can heal him of his skin disease. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes to show how upset he was. He said, I am not God. I cannot kill and make alive again. Why does this man send someone with a skin disease to me to be healed? You can see that the king of Aram is trying to start trouble with me. So when the prophet Elisha, the man of God, heard 
that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent the king a message that said, why have you torn your clothes? Let Naaman come to me. Then he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots to Elisha's house and stood outside the door. Elisha sent Naaman a message which said, go and wash in the Jordan River seven times, and then your skin will be healed and you will be clean. I'm going to suggest to us that what qualifies this little slave girl as one of the most impressive females in the Bible is her bold faith. She unashamedly and unreservedly lived her life as a child, a daughter of the one true Lord God of Israel, even though she was living in a hostile land. So let's see what immortalizes her in the Word of God. First, she had a strong, positive attitude. So a little historical context. After King Solomon died, the 12 tribes of Israel split into two groups. Ten tribes in the north around Samaria were called Israel. Two tribes in the south around Jerusalem were called Judah. Now the north and the south did not get along especially well. Huh. And contrary to God's covenant, they each made alliances to fight against their enemies. Aram was such an enemy. Today, Syria is the place of Aram on the northeast border of Israel. And even today, there is ongoing struggle at that border between Syria and Israel. This story takes place during a time when Aram was the greater power. And they raided Israel, and they captured their people, specifically this young girl. Now since she was a slave and not a concubine, she was probably prepubescent, maybe between seven and ten years of age, a child. And clearly she shows us the kind of childlike faith that Jesus spoke so highly about. Most probably. Her family had been killed. And she had witnessed firsthand some of the worst atrocities of war. For sure, she's been kidnapped and made to serve the very man responsible for all of the war crimes in Israel. He was the commander of the army. And yet, she maintains this strong, positive attitude. That should grab our attention. We might think about what kind of difficult situations we are in that we would murmur and complain about in our lives. And I certainly don't want to minimize any of our struggles or troubles. But maybe we could look at them from a different perspective. Let's look at it, for example, from this young girl's perspective. How do our troubles rate against her troubles? And do we have the same kind of attitude that she has? This little girl had a remarkable faith that she clung to. She truly belonged to God. And with God beside her, she feared nothing. Secondly, she boldly spoke good words with courage and faith about her home, about her people, and about her God. 
All three of those were linked to the covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will be your God, you will be my people, and you will live in the land that I promise. Remember, she was under great and constant pressure living with people who did not like her home or her people or her God. And even though she was not physically at home, she never really left home in her heart. After all, there really is no place like home. Would that my master, meaning Naaman, notice her respect, could be in Samaria, which is her homeland, with our prophet, the Lord's servant, Elisha, so that he would heal my master. So as we read that, here's a question we might ask ourselves. Where's my homeland? As a Christian, as a church member, where well, we would have to be the heavenly kingdom. Wouldn't it? So here's the question. Do we yearn? Do I yearn for my homeland? Am I always in my homeland, in my heart, even though I'm away from it in the body right now? And here's a little more particular question. How do we feel about this church? Do we see it as an outpost? of our heavenly home, which happens to be here in this world? Are we proud of it? How do we speak about it? Do we speak boldly about it? Do we speak positively about it? When we are out in the foreign country, you know, at work, shopping, in school, buying groceries, at the club, at a game? Do we speak wishing and inviting others to be here because they can find healing here? Do we even believe that? Much less speak that? Like this girl, are we speaking openly and lovingly about our God and about our home? Even in the land where God is no longer liked or honored. Are we full of good things to say about our home and about our people and about our God? Here's the reality. God's reputation is at stake in my life. This little girl's inspiring. Third thing, this little girl promoted goodwill and desired people's well-being. Leprosy is what Naaman suffered from common skin disease among Bible people. Through the laws of Moses, hundreds of years earlier, the Hebrews were commanded to separate from those who were afflicted with leprosy. You know, quarantined, isolated, no visitors. We get that. It's no surprise later when we learn that the best medical practice we know of for leprosy is, in fact, isolation. People without the law of God, however, the Gentiles, did not separate. And so Naaman was still in a public position. The girl desired for him to be healed, made well made whole. That's remarkable, isn't it? I mean, take that in. 
she knew from her homeland about healing of others. And she shared that with her mistress. How far removed is that girl's attitude from the one that's so prevalent in our world today. You know, the one that says, don't get mad, get even. Have you paid attention at the basic premise behind 65% of all movies made today is about taking revenge in some way or another? The wronged getting revenge on the perpetrators? My guess is we've all watched a number of those kind of movies. Even with strong emotions maybe inside that we thought, yeah, that's retributive justice right there. I can confess to doing that. And then we add the attitude today among people of differing groups that turns that animosity into violence. It's a problem. If ever someone could be, should be bitter or resentful or vengeful, this little girl had a pretty good cause. But no, that's not what she did. She chose to practice loving kindness. That's one of the fruits of the Spirit. Jesus said, you should produce much fruit and show that you are my followers because that brings glory to my Father. As children of our Heavenly Father, that's what we're supposed to do. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Can you begin to see, really, how impressive this little girl is? She believed that. In our own lives, do we manifest that kind of fruit to promote goodwill and to desire people's well-being, even to our enemies, like she did? Are we looking for what can be good in every situation? Are we seeking God's goodness in and for every person we meet? We might use leprosy as a symbol for sin. In the Bible time, there was no known cure for leprosy. Today, we have some more effective drugs to treat that. But only God could cure a leper. Church. Only God can cure sin. Now people might try to cover their sin, to hide it, like some did their leprosy, but eventually it just becomes too obvious and you can't hide it any longer. Then you have to deal with it because you've been separated and the only escape is to be healed. Only God can heal and forgive. This is a really good way to identify the God of Israel as the one true God when he heals us. That's why the girl wants her master to go to Samaria to the God's prophet. All healing. In our lives yet today, all healing comes only from God. Number four, this girl was a blessing. She was a joy to be around because she was confident she had a good self-image. She felt her place as a child of God. And since her God was an awesome God, she felt good about herself. 
The Old Testament covenant promise with Abraham and God was that you, Abraham, will be blessed in order to be a blessing. All of the nations of the world will be blessed by you. And that basic premise with God's people, the covenant with God's people, holds true even in yours and my life as the church, as God's people in the world today. Now it was hard for the Israelites to realize that to be a chosen one of God was not in order to set them apart, to elevate them above everybody else, no. And by the way, that's where the accusation aimed at us at the church comes from today when people think we are judgmental in our attitude. But the reason they were chosen and set apart, you know, was for the purpose of being useful to other people, to serve other people, in order to bring them in connection with the one true God. Blessing others. That's not a natural characteristic of our human nature. In fact, most life forms in the world, we humans included, live in self-preservation. We're prepared to fight and to struggle hard to keep what we have, simultaneously looking to see if we might take something that we think we can get. To break out of that cycle and be a blessing is clearly what separates us from the world as a child of God. Today we identify a child of God as a believer in Jesus Christ. As I have loved you, so you should love others. And that's where we cling to one of our most basic truths that we've talked about almost a year ago now. I belong to Jesus Christ and I define who I am by what he says. When I have assurance of truly belonging to God, knowing that God loves me, and sent his son to die for me, that becomes the foundation for my self-esteem, my self-identity. I realize that I am important and loved by God. That's an amazing realization. It's life-changing because it allows me to become whole, to be healed of all the things that are happening inside me. It gives me a purpose. When we truly grasp that truth, we become a joy to be around. Why? Because we don't need anything from anybody else. Let that sink in. I don't need to prove anything to anybody else. I'm free from that. And we don't need people to affirm what's good about me. I'm free from that. My self-identity comes from the fact that God loves me and sent his son to die for me. What does that free me up to do? That frees me up simply to enjoy who I am and then enjoy who you are. The girl did not have to lift herself up above those who were around her. She didn't have to be better than them. Nor did she have to undermine them and pull them down so that they became just like her. She didn't need any approval from other people, and she didn't fear the disapproval of other people. She simply was concerned about who she was 
as a child of God. And that allowed her to be a blessing to others and a joy to be around. Last, the girl was a bridge builder, an ambassador, a reconciler. Paul calls every believer, every child of God, an ambassador. And we know ambassadors represent one group while they're involved with another group in order to make good relations between the two. Hence the idea of building bridges or promoting reconciliation or bringing about healing or making peace. This girl was a marvelous ambassador, representing God in a wholesome, helpful way, and making things better where she was, being a peacemaker, keeping shalom in her culture. The Hebrews' concept of shalom is the ultimate understanding of what peace is. Shalom far exceeds our concept when we use the word peace. We think simply of an absence of strife or war, and that's what marks peace. Shalom includes harmony and security and well-being and safety and prosperity and wholeness. It's impossible to wish more than shalom on somebody else. That's how big that concept was. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus blessed the peacemakers. The girl could have kept the animosity of war between her people and the Arameans alive in her heart, living in bitterness. But instead, as a child of God, she became an ambassador, building bridges with love and forgiveness, trying to make peaceful relationships. Every time love and forgiveness are applied in a situation, whatever that situation, and whomever is involved, good things will happen. Life will get better. Bridges to right relationships will be built and crossed. So, did you get it? What we're talking about is sharing God's grace, being light and salt in the world, making where we are a better place because we're ambassadors for God. We're peacemakers in the world. That might not be considered heroic. It might not make headlines anywhere. But stop to think about this. Why and how are we remembering and talking about this little girl some 3,000 years after she lived, when we don't even know her name? Why is she immortalized in God's Word? Is it because of the family she belonged to or the family she raised? No. Is it because of her possessions or her status in society? No. Is it because of her wisdom or her intelligence or her beauty or her education? No. Is it because she was a great leader? No. Because of her awesome accomplishments? No. Because of the things she wrote and left for us? No. 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 
Friends, this little nameless girl was nothing more than a child of God. A true child of God. And you know what? That's the absolute best any of us can be. If we can achieve that, being a true child of God, even though our names might be lost, our lives will be remembered for years to come. Heavenly Father, thank you how your spirit lived in this little girl. Thank you for the record of her in your holy scriptures. And may she inspire each one of us today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. to drink.
be a blessing. Thank you for joining us. God bless you until we meet again.